I'd like to introduce Todd Redding, CVG's president and CEO, who will, who will be leading today's conversation. I'm the co-host with 49% of the power, apparently. <laughs> Very nice to see everybody here today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I can see a list of panelists, or I mean, a list of attendees, a lot of familiar names in there. Shout out to Vincent, good to see you. Pearl, a number of people who have worked with us in the past. Um, and we, uh, it's really great to have everybody uh, online today. We want this to be a really informative uh, presentation. So uh, please ask questions in that, in that question window. Emily will, will stop us and interrupt us anytime and we can, we can address your questions, but we wanna make sure this is a real value to you. Um, and just glad you're all here. I wanna introduce you to uh, Tahia Chin. Tahia is in San Francisco. Sarah Lippe, Sarah is in uh, Seattle. And Lori Rego, Lori is in New York City. Um, all three of these great people who have graciously given uh, some of their time to talk with you today uh, are were a part of our Shred Venture Group uh, partners, um, and I am was fortunate enough to play a role in their interview process as they were each uh, hired by our partner firms um, to be in sort of this administrative role. We're going to call it office. Manager is kind of the, the traditional title that we put with it. it. Really doesn't make any difference what you call it. Each of these people is fundamental to the operations of their small firms and they're doing just great work. And we've learned a lot about what this position can kind of shape, how it can shape and what it can involve um, through these, these three individuals as well as others that, uh, that are on online uh, listening in. So uh, we just thought a conversation with Tahia, with uh, Sarah and Lori today would be helpful to firms that are beginning to think about what adding this position to their firm, or maybe you've got a person in this role today and you're wondering how to best utilize that person's skills. Um, but we have seen just the transformational impact that adding this uh, position to your small firm uh, can have. And so we thought a conversation about that uh, would be helpful to you all. So we're living in a different world today, clearly. Um, things of 2020 is unlike any other, for sure. Um, and uh, we had a, a conversation uh, earlier about what each of these firms is doing to kind of embrace this virtual work environment. And I thought, Lori and Tahia and Sarah, we, I want to hear some some of your comments about what your firm is doing to, to deal with the virtual world. And I know you had some really good insights about this when we talked earlier. Why don't we start with you, Sarah? What's, what's building work in, in Seattle doing to, to, uh, to keep the team together and, and embrace this virtual work? Um, so one of the things that we've worked really hard to do these last eight or nine months is to keep everything as normal as we can. So all of our uh, usual activities that we've done, like we still have to do them online, but we've tried to like replicate them as much as we can. Um, a good example is that on Monday was the AAA Seattle Honors Awards event. That's a big event for us. We always go out as a team for dinner and drinks beforehand and then head over to the event together. And so this time we did, um, we just did a virtual happy hour beforehand. Um, it also happened to be a uh, one of our employees first days with building work. So we use that time to do a meet and greet and we um, sort of one of our employees um, kind of set up some games for us to play. And we have that going. And then we all went over to the virtual honors event award, which was um, hosted on YouTube and we all watched it on our own, but we had a Slack channel going at the same time where we could talk um, and chat and talk about the projects um, so it was a way to sort of replicate that same experience without actually having, without actually having that experience be accessible in person. You guys meet uh, as a team, you meet virtually uh, once a week? Yeah, we meet virtually once a week as a team uh, for our Monday morning meeting. Um, we also have a lot of meetups throughout the week as well. Um, we have like a young professional development group and they meet once a week. Um, we have an ARCHICAD group that meets once a week to talk about best practices and work through sort of some software issues. Um, and then uh, a few of us will do, 
we'll try to uh, do check-ins throughout the week as well. Um, one of my coworkers actually just lives a few blocks from me. So I just meet up and we go for walks um, and grab a cup of coffee. And that seems like, you know, it just makes things seem normal again. And then you do a, do you do a once a month meeting? I think Tahia does the once a month once meeting. A month. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I knew it was somebody, I couldn't remember who. And Sarah, real quick, how, how big is building work? How many people? Um, we just got to 11 people. Okay. Awesome. Our, we hired our, our 11th person started on Monday. Okay, awesome. And um, yeah, that, that's fantastic. How about Tahia, how about you? Uh, what's, uh, what's Winter Gibson doing uh, to kind of embrace this virtual work environment? We're doing a lot of the same things that Sarah is. I think the main um, the main point that we want to do and the main thing that I'm pushing with our team is actually just making sure that we kind of virtualize anything that we were, any of the experiences that we were having before in person prior to COVID. So um, we do have our monthly office meetings. Um, we had stopped them for a little bit um, when COVID had initially began, I think just because we were so um, inundated with the work and just trying to figure out this new world that we're in and, and how to kind of get through the first couple of weeks of it. Um, but what we actually found, what I actually found was the team morale um, was actually coming down um, and we were having issues that we couldn't really address in our weekly um, meeting where we actually discussed the projects and the tasks and the status of the different projects. Um, and so because of that, um, after talking with the PMs and our execs, we decided to bring back the monthly office meeting and now we do them virtually um, once a month. And um, the first one that we did, um, we actually included something that we call happies and crappies um, to basically bring out a lot of the issues that people were having. We wanted to um, bolster all the good things that were going on that we were doing um, virtually and make sure that we continue to do those. Um, but I also wanted to make sure that any issues that people were having, we kind of brought those to the front um, and then figure out how we were going to address them over the next couple of months and, and, and kind of utilize them um, and kind of bring them into um, my regular um, work so that I can make sure that we actually deal with those issues and they don't kind of fall to the, fall to the side. Tia, you organize those meetings, you kind of plan for them and do you, do you run them, the monthly meetings? Yes, yeah, so um, I schedule them, um, plan them, and then I put together the full agenda for the meeting, um, including any icebreakers or anything like that, reaching out to any PMs or anybody. Sometimes we have um, small training sessions in there to go over maybe things that we want to re reiterate with the team, um, and then we'll go over that there, and then I send that to the execs to review, add any additional things, maybe take out some, any agenda items that maybe we want to push to a later time or make space for something more important, um, and I think it actually helps them not to think about, not like they don't have to worry about that thing, that um, item for a while until they see the agenda, they can figure out what topics they want, and it's not something that they have to focus a lot of their time on. Them. Makes sense, makes sense. And how many employees at Winter Gibson? Um, we have 12 now. Um, like Sarah, we remotely brought someone on board um, last week. So we are a total of 12 now. Right, right, right. And Sarah, um, how big was building work when you, when you joined the firm? I, I can't recall, it's been a couple of years. Um, I was either the eighth or ninth person at Building Work when I joined about yeah, two, like a little over two and a half years ago. Okay, that's what I recall as well. Lori, how about the Up Studio? What are you guys? Uh, what are you guys doing? Um, we are actually having weekly meetings. We call them weekly rundowns, and it happens every Monday morning. Um, and in that, there's we're an eight-person team. I was also the eighth hire, <laughs> um, and uh, that was earlier this year. So we have our weekly meeting um, where we go over every active project as a group. And if anyone has something to chime in and talk about um, that needs to get done in that particular week or any updates, maybe the clients reached out over the weekend and the team should know what's most up-to-date and current. It's also a time for the team to say, oh, you know what? Julia, I actually need to meet with you about such and such. Let's hop on a call after this. And it kind of just helps the dialogue um, begin for each of those projects right at the beginning of the week, um, which I think is helpful for anyone who might not be in a more project manager position, but kind of a junior architect role. Um, it helps kind of pave whatever their 
workload's going to look like for that week. And it gets all of our project managers thinking about tasks in a more um, kind of in a way of delegation. It helps people understand what they can delegate for the week and maybe who's best to delegate to. And we kind of just have that discussion and it takes about 45 minutes to an hour or so. And Lori, you, uh, Up Studio is using Harvest for time tracking. Um, you, I know you're you're kind of experimenting with ClickUp for task management. Um, and you, when you all meet to discuss projects, you know, are you? Can you describe kind of your role in that meeting and your role in organizing that work and how you've been addressing that? Yeah, I can address how we have been doing it, but we are currently changing it <laughs> kind of as we speak um, because of ClickUp and our implementation we're about to put into place with ClickUp. Um, but for the past six or seven months, it's been a spreadsheet, kind of what we've been calling our capacity chart or capacity like workflow planner. It doesn't have a great name, but um, I gather all of the information from that Monday meeting and I put together a capacity chart that shows who's working about how many hours that week on which project. And we wanna make sure that people are getting to 40 hours, but not beyond, and hopefully not under. And if they are under, that's our way of saying, great, so-and-so has extra time, and this person has too much time. Let's see if that person can delegate anything to the person who has the capacity this week to help free them up a bit. Um, it's not a perfect system the spreadsheet that we have and the way that we've been doing it and we've learned that, it's so hard to predict how long a task is going to take and how much time you're going to actually spend on a project. That's not real, but it's a good starting point and it helps at least know that everyone has something to work on um, or gives them an opportunity to say help if they need it right at the beginning of the week. Um, Hopefully in the very near future though, that spreadsheet becomes ClickUp, which is not only going to be our task management and delegation system, but our project scheduling system. So we'll be able to actually see um, a real timeline for each of our projects kind of in Gantt form, which will help kind of flag if we've been in a phase for too long or if something's been on hold or if we really need to touch base on a project at a particular phase. And Sarah, I know the capacity planning spreadsheet, when you arrived at building work, you created a number of different tools to kind of set up projects and manage capacity. And then you all have moved on to Monograph, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so we started using Monograph a while ago. I don't actually remember when, uh, I guess two years ago or something like that, a year and a half ago. And um, we mostly been using it for its timesheet applications, but they just launched like a bunch of new products or released them on their web app um, that have essentially what Lori was just talking about, which is the capacity chart. Um, and with that capacity chart, I really think it's going to be a lot more powerful. And I actually want to like pick Lori's brain now about how she's been working with it so I can um, give like figure out how it will work with Monograph and then get our PMs on board and then sort of begin to sort of implementing it and making like monograph a much more functional part of our work environment that pulls in a lot of the data that's available and that's out there um, in a way that can help maybe make our team more efficient or as Lori pointed out point out where people um, might have too many might be overworked or underworked and so where we can move staffing around um, and see that type of information that could be useful yeah and I, I think one of the one of the messages I think all of our small firms are, are attending today can take away. It's just, you know, each of these people has has brought some great skills to the table and really helped the firm manage these projects and, uh, and stay within budget and stay efficient. And, you know, regardless of what tool you're using, they all three of them have really proactively sought ways to, to improve the system. Uh, and that that's what I think is is so fundamentally important about uh, this position within a small firm is it really it's it's the person to help really keep the firm operating efficiently and profitably. Tahia, what what I remind me what system you all I think you're using Harvest as well for time tracking, right? 
Yes, we're using um, Harvest now for, uh, we've been using Harvest since I started um, for the time tracking. Um, and then we are looking at new tools. We're actually looking at RIPE right now. Um, we're testing RIPE out for our project management tool. Um, and hopefully it will have some scheduling things in, in, in there to help us with our, our scheduling. We just have an Excel spreadsheet right now, <laughs> um, Lori. So I totally understand that with trying to um, manage everyone's time. Um, with that, so hope I'm hoping um, that with the new um, Rike software, um, and once we begin using it, that it will help us kind of free up more of our time as well, because we won't be spending so much time actually trying to manage, um, man physically manage the projects and figure out where everyone's time is. Right. One of the um, well, you know, Satya, there's a question about what can, what software is that is Rike? Can you spell that, and what website can they go to to learn more? So the spelling is W-R-I-K-E. Um, and uh, one of our PMs is actually leading the charge with that um, software. I think if you just Google Reich, it should come up. Um, but it's, a, it's supposed to be a full, a full project management software that helps us manage the project from, uh, from, the, from start to finish. And I believe it should also have, that's one of the things we're testing out is we, we're looking for something that the client can also utilize that we can, because um, right now we're in Trello or um, Google Sheets and things like that for sharing some um, project timeline information with the, with the clients. Um, so I believe that's one of the things that we're looking at with it as well is once we kind of learn all of the internal tools, figuring out how we can kind of turn some of those things outward facing so that our, our clients, we can easily just click or download or share something with them that they don't have to have like a separate software for as well. Right. So, so just to recap, so the audience understands the different tools that we're talking about, um, Lori has been experimenting with ClickUp, which uh, I have also been Kind of playing around with honestly because Lori found it and told me about it um, and uh, and they uh, the up studio in New York uh, at eight people is also using harvest for time tracking to he is using uh, Rike w-r-i-k-e uh, looking at that for project management also using harvest for time tracking uh, and uh, 11 people at uh, at, at Winder Gibson and then Sarah at Building Work. Sarah, remind us, are you eight, nine people at Building Work? We're at 11. At 11, right, right. And um, using um, uh, Monograph for time tracking and project management, right? Um, Hopefully really soon for project management. For project management, right, right. Uh, now, one, one interesting thing that I think the audience needs to be aware of is that in all three of these cases, none of Sarah, uh, Lori, nor Tahia are doing the day-to-day -day bookkeeping. Each of their firms has outsourced the uh, bookkeeping function to a virtual bookkeeper uh, and um, they interact certainly and have various roles with invoicing. But uh, we often find in small firms that uh, this position can be so much better utilized if they're not spending their time reconciling and doing the bookkeeping stuff. And in fact, the virtual bookkeepers, since that's what they do every hour of the day, they're super efficient at it. Uh, and which allows each of them to really focus on the operations of the firm. And I, I can see all three of them nodding their heads that I'm, I'm, I'm correct and they're, they're thrilled with this setup and, uh, and we, we advise it. Um, now, uh, we often get asked when, when we start searching for uh, this position in, in a small firm, we often get asked, you know, should we be looking for someone who has experience in architecture? And quite honestly, uh, you know, in my opinion, that's secondary to some other skills. I would like maybe each of you to talk a little bit about what you did before you got to your firm and the learning curve that it took to kind of get familiar with the world of architecture, because we don't, we don't see that as a, rec as a requirement necessarily for somebody to be successful in this role. Lori, um, did you come from a background in architecture? <laughs> I sure didn't. I uh, spent over a decade managing hair salons. Um, I'm actually a licensed cosmetologist, <laughs> which is um, not super helpful. Not a requirement to be successful in this job. You don't have to be a licensed cosmetologist. Yeah, no, you, you don't have to do hair. But um, after that, I, I left and I, I spent two years um, in landscape design, in office management and assistant project management. And then I moved on to a development and general contracting company um, for about a year. And I was the office manager and assistant project manager there. So 
I knew that I wanted to shift my career into um, just a different place, which was home design. And I think there are a lot of parallels in that I have to think on my toes all the time. I have to be a creative problem solver. I have to keep a positive attitude. If one of my solutions doesn't work, I just have to keep going and find a new solution that will work. Um, I have to remain flexible and adaptable because my position will change based on what my, the small business that I work for needs. And all of that was true in my past industry as well. So there was a lot of carryover in that. Um, and I think coming from my particular background, I'm pretty good at laughing through tough times because that's just what you do in my previous industry. So it, it helps, especially going through, uh, I started with the company a week before we went remote and that proved to be somewhat challenging, but I think remaining flexible and um, proactive in finding things I could do without my team needing to spend every moment finding things for me to do um, was important. And I do think that that came from my background. Yeah, I think that's a that's a common trait. I know knowing all three of you, uh, adaptable to a changing environment would be one of the top things on my list uh, that all three of you have uh, is really a strength, you know, being adaptable, being organized and willing to take on challenges and find solutions is certainly is um, a, a core strength. Tahia, uh, you want to talk a little bit about your background, where you came from? Yeah, I actually um, uh, came from uh, the tele, uh, tele, uh, telecommunications world. Um, and before that, I was in um, pharmaceutical, uh, the pharmaceutical consulting world. And then before that, um, I was in um, the healthcare industry. Um, and so in all of those different um, industries, I was always in a support or administrative role, but it's been completely new industries, completely new terminology, just everything new um, every time I've kind of changed my careers. Um, and like Lori and you said, I think adaptability is key in, in this role. Um, I think you need to be able to um, uh, be able to stand on your feet and kind of switch things as needed based on the company need, uh, company needs um, and the role of the company, um, your role in the company and um, those that you support will change and the needs of the company will change. Um, and like Lori said, you have to be kind of able to go with that um, and some, sometimes let, let things roll off your back if they're not kind of going your way and push through those, those tough times. Yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. Sarah, how about you? Um, so I came through in very various different ways. I was wrapping up my master's degree in art history at the time and I was micro jobbing. And so I was struggling about maybe four or five different jobs across different fields from yoga to, um, to teaching. And I spent most of my time at a letterpress studio where we made greeting cards and um, at the letterpress studio, I was their first employee and, um, and we grew to about a, a group of like five or six. And I spent a lot of my time working in sales and operations and like logistics management. Um, and like Tahia and Lori said, uh, there's a lot of um, adaptability, being able to think on your feet, um, making sure, seeing that there is a problem and then trying to find a solution, saying like, oh, this is taking us too much time or every time we do this task, we're replicating, we're doing like, like we're replicating a lot of work that we could just out, like we could, we could easily figure out a way to sort of, um, you know, create a form. So everyone, anyone could do this work at any time we could switch off who, who has the time to do it or um, noticing like that there's a pattern in that, hey, if we set something up this way, we can do it a lot more efficiently and things like that. Um, and those are always, I think really useful opportunities that I used a lot when I started at building work was just noticing what what needed maybe a little extra help or a little more finesse to sort of create sort of up um, um, like a pattern or a solution that could be really easily replicated um, and like almost automatic like um, automated uh, to make sure that you know it was replicable and we can make it fast and easy. Yeah, you bring up a really good point. We get, uh, you know, asked a lot by firms that don't currently have this position and they're kind of thinking about it. We get asked about, well, what, what would I instruct them to do? You know, what, 
you know, we can give them sample job descriptions, but they, they get really caught up in um, thinking that they need to lay out every activity and every task for this person uh, for them to be fully utilized. And, and I know all three of you have told me one of the most valuable uh, parts of your job has been the freedom to explore you know, a lot of different solutions. And you didn't come into a job that had a prescribed hour by hour task list. You know, uh, Tahia, you kind of got thrown into the fire because one of the partners at Winter Gibson uh, went on paternity leave so shortly after you uh, started. But you want to talk a little bit about the value of having the freedom to kind of, you know, develop this job on your own. Uh, yeah, it was... Um... It, it was a scary thing um, at first. I just started, just to let everyone know, I started at Winter Gifts on January 2nd of 2020. Um, and then shortly after the shelter in place came um, in, into place. And then after that, our principal um, went out on maternity, uh, paternity leave for his first child um, and really wanted to be out. And I think that autonomy actually um, of forcing me to actually do more for the company because I saw the need um, actually helped me more um, uh, grow in this position, actually, the fact that he wasn't around and the fact that he gave me so much autonomy um, to kind of do my job and figure things out um, while he wasn't there, as well as the freedom to kind of make mistakes, own up for the mistakes, you know, figure out whatever it was that went wrong and then move past that, um, I think is, is, is key. But um, while Jeff has been out, it's it's been a lot, I think, for the team, um, looking at his emails and just the amount of emails and covering all of the different projects and making sure they get out to the proper people that they need to get to or maybe get back to him if it's reached that level and him reaching out and then the invoicing and all of the different things that he deals with and assisting him with that also gave me a, a lot more respect and understanding for his position um, as well. Excellent. And Lori, Lori's got you beat in terms of starting pre-pandemic. Lori, when was your first day? Um, March 1st, and I think March 11th is when we went remote. <laughs> Great. Okay. Yeah. So you had, you had plenty of freedom. Is that, is that a good way of saying it? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But I think my team I, I have a great team. I think I would have had the same amount of freedom if, yeah. if we were in person, to be fair. Yeah, for sure. But I think you would agree that that having that freedom to explore, I mean, you've, you know, the dis discovery of ClickUp, I think, is an example of uh, you having the ability to kind of explore things and figure them out before, you know, you roll it out to the whole team or, or it wasn't like it wasn't an ass assignment. You sort of proactively found that and have helped develop it. Yeah, and it was after I admitted that the first version of the solution to our problems wasn't the right long-term solution. Sometimes it's important for this position to create a system and then keep analyzing and adjusting and assessing that solution months after to make sure it's still the appropriate fit. And that spreadsheet I made six months ago was a good Band-Aid, but it was a Band-Aid. And right. so now we're at the point where I have a little bit of extra time and I can dig in again. Um, and I did try monographs So Sarah. I would love to actually chat with you sometime. Um, ClickUp seems to be the best fit for our particular challenges that we're trying to, to yes. sort out, but it's just, you gotta be flexible. Yeah, you know, we, we oh, yes, Emily, sorry, go ahead. I just wanna make sure that we, we stand back for a little bit maybe and talk about what all your job responsibilities are because we're diving into specifics but we did have a really good question about okay understood that you're not handling bookkeeping but are you doing invoicing are you doing hr are you doing proposals are you doing marketing and i don't I'm sorry if i'm jumping ahead with this but i think it'd probably be good to talk about the your basic job description yeah no i think i think it's a great question sarah i would like to hear your your response um we do see you know it's it's a common um a common mistake among small firms when they decide, you know, to, to hire their first administrative position, and suddenly everything that's non-billable becomes a part of that person's responsibility. Right? Well, they can do bookkeeping and they can do marketing, and uh, they're young, so they must know social media, right? Um, you know, so they and they kind of throw everything at this person, and that is almost always a mistake. Um, you know, there's some the rare exceptions out there, but. You know, having this position really focused on operations and then finding the, the right bookkeeping solution and perhaps even the right marketing solution 
although I, each each of these people I know is involved in some regard in that level. But Sarah, why don't you take the lead and and just if you could describe you know describe your role within the firm and what what are some of the core things that you do. So I always like to joke that what I do is I do everything that's not architecture. So I don't build the building. Don't ask me what that is. They're buildings, they stand up, they have roofs and windows. I like them, they keep me warm and dry. After that, I do everything else. So um, at the very basic um, end, I order the coffee, I make sure we have paper and pens. Um, and at the upper end, I do, I do all the invoicing and I help out with the marketing. So all the in-between stuff um, is a lot. So a day-to-day -day or a month-to-month -month sort of rotation of activities is kind of how I see how my job and how my role works. Um, so we'll start with invoicing because that's the really big thing for our firm. And that was one of the big things that I took over right away was we had an outside bookkeeper, but we were still doing um, we still do all of our invoicing in-house and then we just send that information to our bookkeeper and instead of just doing a lot of back and forth intermediaries between um, our principal um, and the bookkeeper to make sure things are right, he could just talk to me and since I knew what all the projects were doing and how they were working on a day-to-day -day basis and I understood what consultants and I was getting all the consultant invoices um, every day in the mail that it was a lot easier for me to compile that information and give it to present the consultant invoices and the um, the amount of time that we've billed to the project to the principal who would then make the final decision about what we are billing and then compile that send it to our client and then send it to our bookkeeper who would then go do her bookkeeping things um, and so that takes up a lot of energy that usually is the last week and the first week of um, the last week of a month and then the first week of the next month where I'm wrapping up the invoicing and then producing um, various reports that we use to sort of know where each project is because it's a good time to sort of summarize and look at that information. And then in between those months uh, or those weeks, um, I'll spend more of my time in marketing, um, which I began in the last year or so to take to help out and take on a more role. And I would recommend not throwing that on your, your admin right away. Um, but that's something I sort of stepped in because I saw that it was a spot that wasn't getting the type of attention it needed. Um, and it was sort of flailing. It still is kind of sort of flailing, but I'm working a lot more partly because I, I don't have any experience in marketing. So I'm learning a lot on the job and on the go. And I might be young, but I'm not really social media savvy. So it's just a lot of learning with me and then a lot of sort of figuring out how to balance my time, which I really like because I don't like doing the same thing day after day. So getting to rotate between um, like invoicing and project management and working on that and then going into the marketing is really fun and keeps me interested in the work I'm doing. And then I also do a bit of HR. So I do all of our onboarding. Um, I do all of our prep work for, for getting a new employee, um, preparing the office or our virtual office for our new employee and making sure meetings are set up and training and things like that. Um, and then I'm our liaison between our our IT firm, which we also outsource all of our IT. So I work with them closely to make sure that all of our computers and our network are set up. And then of course I'm our liaison for all of our um, vendors that we work with as well. Makes sense, makes sense. That's a great, a great description. Um, and each of you has a little bit of a unique, you know, there are some differences between your roles too. So Tahia, um, I might just mention to the audience, you know, Charette Venture Group does provide virtual bookkeeping services for small firms. Tahia's firm is one, uh, one firm that's taking advantage of that. Um, so Tahia, would you describe your, your role? Um, so uh, I do um, a lot of the basic office management stuff, office orders and things like that, keeping, making sure that they have everything that they need while in the office or virtually ordering things and sending it directly to their homes now um, during COVID times. Um, I also assist in the invoicing. We do um, take uh, uh, use uh, CFG's bookkeeping services. Um, we we have Nicole. We're very very happy um, with her. Um, I work very closely um, with her. We talk pretty frequently, especially when it gets to the invoicing um, time. Um, and she she kind of puts all of our spreadsheets and, and 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 everything together like that, and keeps track of all of that different stuff. And then I. Um, 
actually um, send out the invoices um, um, every month and um, work with her to either um, make updates to them or if she's unavailable, make direct updates to the invoice and then let her know um, what I've done. Um, I'm also working to one of our um, principals is actually going to be retiring at the end of this year. Um, and so I am working on taking over some of his um, accounting duties, like paying for um, paying bills and stuff like that, and then sending those um, payment receipts and stuff like that over to Nicole um, for reconciliation and, and those types of things. Um, I'm also, because John is, is going to be retiring, I've, I've taken over payroll. Um, so I'm processing payroll and de dealing with the um, uh, PTO and vacation accrual process. Um, like Sarah, I'm also assisting with um, human resources um, lightly with the onboarding um, process. Um, I actually had to cre create the, um, the full remote onboarding thing, um, uh, uh, onboarding plan for our new employee um, about a week and a half, two weeks before he started, but it, it went very well and now we have that in place. Um, our principal and then now another employee um, are, had uh, babies this year, one will be having a baby next year, so I had to put together um, a paternity leave or family leave plan that kind of covers um, federally in California and then San Francisco has some very specific rules in regards to that, so I had to kind of put all of um, that together, so I do handle um, some of some those pieces of HR things. Um, and then I also assist with marketing along with Jeff and another one of our studio directors assist me with that. And so we kind of um, divide and conquer uh, type of thing um, based on what we all kind of enjoy. So it kind of helps us. Um, and I kind of focus on the, the LinkedIn portion of it and updating that in the Pinterest, um, which is really fun for me. Um, so um, I am involved in some of those. And then I've been assisting more with some project onboarding um, and um, updating to our proposal template so that they don't have to update all of the different things. If some of the things, if some of the fields are repeating, I actually went through and was able to update that so that they just enter it once and then they don't have to enter the data anymore. And so now I'm kind of slowly getting involved more in um, the beginning parts of uh, getting a project um, and proposal and then assisting with once a project um, has been um, approved and the a proposal sign, making sure that our servers and um, uh, our and our project folders are updated in the manner that we like our, our projects updated. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> can I add something? Yeah. Um, I partly remember this from Tahia and then also through the chat, which I was just looking at. Um, but I do work on the marketing side. I I started from the very beginning when I started with building work. I was um, working on proposals. Um, and at building work, it wasn't super overwhelming since we had a really good design and good structure and a lot of good content for our proposal. And after working through it a few times, um, closely with our principal and our associate, I was able to get the hang of it. And now I can pretty much produce them with almost no oversight um, from our principal who just will briefly go through or maybe add in um, you know, some more details that I might be missing. Um, and that I think was a good thing to was really useful for our firm to pull off our principal's plate and like move on to into my position. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I, I've seen the question come up a couple of times about um, size of firm and age of firm. And let me just mention that we do, what we really see is when a firm gets to be four or five full-time billable people, that's when you need to start getting really serious about administrative support. Um, in, in each of these cases, uh, all three of your firms, uh, I think if the partners were here, they would say they waited too long <laughs> that they, uh, now in Winter Gibson's case, John started kind of phasing into getting ready for retirement and he took on a lot of the tasks that Tahia is taking on. But I know in Matt's case of building work and in the up studio, they would say, yeah, we probably should have done that a little while, a little earlier, uh, because it just gets to a point where the, the firm owners are spending a lot of time doing things that they should not be doing. Um, and that could be, you know, better utilized with some support. Um, and Laura, you want to take a, a minute to describe, kind of describe your role? Because I think yours is a, is a little unique uh, compared to Tahia's and Sarah's. Yeah, um, 
in addition to all the day-to-day -day operations that Tahia and Sarah and almost every office manager um, does, I have quite a strong role in our marketing and our business development. So we use HubSpot for our um, like lead tracking and management. So um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I manage the operations. So any sort of um, system that needs to be put into place, onboarding manuals, employee manuals, and checklists, uh, this ClickUp project that I'm now really deep into, um, checking our info inbox and being the first point of contact should someone email the studio. Um, that being said, I'm also the first point of contact when leads come in and I can kind of suss out who should go straight to one of the partners um, and kind of nurture those beginning relationships. Um, but the goal is always to schedule a call with one of the partners. And so that's really what I manage in HubSpot. But I also manage the organization of HubSpot and the system within business development. So I'm not just supporting the actual client communication. I'm supporting the efficiencies on the back end um, for us to manage our business development. When it comes to marketing, um, one of our main goals is publications and awards. So submission research and actually executing those award submissions and gathering those materials, um, keeping a marketing calendar with one of our partners to make sure that we're hitting every mark that we're hoping to, um, discussing social media that I don't personally have much of a hand in the social media content. One of our partners is stellar at that. Um, um, let's see, additionally, uh, PR. So press outreach when a project is complete, I'll assist in any photo shoot scheduling and management along with one of our partners. Um, if we need last minute staging, I'll show up and bring my plants even sometimes like if like whatever the projects need to look their best at the end and get those photos so that I can have a great award submission. Um, that's also part of, of what I do um, on the operations front. I'm just available for the team if, if they're like, hey, I need help working through this spreadsheet or can you do research to find X for me? I do a lot of small research projects. Um, looking for like blogs and podcasts who we might want to reach out to to partner with at some point. So it's kind of the future forward thinking stuff that the studio needs, but the partners can't really spend a lot of their time on anymore. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, there was a question on the screen about, um, you know, about salary and is it a full-time or part-time position? Since I'm sitting in front of three people that I greatly respect, I'm gonna say, 300,000 a year is about right for this position, um, but happy to fill, if you wanna drop me an email, happy to talk with you. It, you know, the, the salary range really has a lot to do with what, what you, the, the breadth of talent that you need and the years of experience that you're hiring and your local market. You know, it's very different uh, in San Francisco than it is, you know, in Ohio, uh, so um, it, it's all over the map, but um, many firms start off with a part-time position. I will tell you in almost every case, every firm that we've worked with, they've started off part-time thinking that they wanna save money and take this carefully. Within 30 days, they're, they're going to full-time. Uh, it just, it, it's, it becomes very clear very soon uh, that this position can, can really pay for itself and be uh, of great assistance. Uh, so um, those, those are my answers to that. So if they were to go out and advertise for this, where did you guys learn about uh, the position and, and talk a little bit about how a firm went about hiring you? Of course, I, I, I played the initial role of kind of the screening, you know, are these people credible and able to show up on time for an interview? But beyond that, you know, what was the process like as you as you learned about the position and, and also where, where did you hear about it? Tahia, how, how'd you hear about Winder Gibson? Um, I actually heard about the position through LinkedIn um, and um, reached out and applied for the position. And, and then um, Todd uh, got back with me and he, as he said, he was the first contact and first um, um, interview that we did virtually um, as well. It just so happened at the time because I'm in San Francisco and he's not. Right. Um, and um, I think it, for me, the process was very well. I think it, just just to put it out there, I'm a big fan of CBG. 
Um, you guys um, have been wonderful from the time that I, um, like from interviewing all the way through now and, and assisting my firm and things like that. So uh, definitely Todd, I think that going through the interview process with you, you, you presented the data and information in the industry very well because I had no idea um, about the architecture world and field um, and, and, and how, um, how it was to work in that environment. Um, so I think the first interview that I did with you was very helpful to um, encourage me to actually go to the next step and, 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 and meet, with, um, meet with Jeff and John. Um, and see how everything went from there. And then when I met with them, um, I just really enjoyed the office. Um, I really enjoyed um, the autonomy that I thought I would get. Um, and I really was interested in going back to um, a small office environment and helping a team kind of grow from small to, to large again and figuring out how, you know, the processes along with that, I was really excited to, to be a part of another small team. Yeah, sure. That's thank you to you, and thanks for the compliment. Appreciate it, and enjoy working with you as well. And Sarah, um, it's been a few years, so I can't I can't remember where you learned about building work. And I, I do remember our interview, but I don't remember how you found. No, it was at the spot. Was our interview online two years ago, or three years ago? It was in 2018. Um, I I think I found it on the AAI Seattle website okay. on their job board, but I'm not 100 percent sure about that. Um, but I knew that I was looking for um, a position like what I ended up in, um, in sort of a, a creative field. I wanted to work in something. I, I'd done a lot of work with creative people and I wanted to sort of still keep that sort of mentality um, and not like move into something that I thought was really, um, I don't know, about just about sales or something that didn't seem to have like a good vision and a strong passion. Um, but like Tahi, I worked, I first met, I submitted my application and then I um, met with Todd and we talked um, in an interview. And then from there, I think you talked to, I don't know, you sent like five or six names to our principal, Matt, and then he interviewed us. Um, so eventually I met with Matt and then I think I met with Matt twice and then got the job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just so everybody understands CDG, uh, one of the things that we do for our partner firms is we organize these searches and help firm owners really make smart decisions about how to go about hiring, how to negotiate the job, what kinds of people they're looking for. All too often, small firms, because they're overwhelmed, you know, they need to hire somebody and they've got a cousin George that's looking for a job and maybe we should just bring George in and we try to step back and take a, a much broader view of the search process and, and CBG will organize that process, gather all of the resumes, you know, with each of these people, we had just initial, you know, introductory calls, very casual, kind of get to know their interests, um, tell them about the firm and then advise the owners on people that they should spend a little more time getting to know and kind of narrow the search down to, to that, that one person. And fortunately, in all three of these cases, We've been tremendously successful, so <laughs> we're not going to talk about any that we were not successful on, but uh, tremendously with these. Lori, where did you hear about it? And uh, until you might also talk a little bit about what after you and I met and and uh, John, I think contacted you. You know what what was the process like? Mine was a little different. Um, I relocated to New York City mid January from San Francisco. Um, so I was actually looking for a position exactly like this one. I just hadn't started looking yet. Right at that time, I told a good friend of mine who's an architect here in New York, hey, if you know anybody within your community who needs either an assistant project manager or office manager, can you let me know? And he is good friends with John of my studio. And it just turned out that they were looking for me right when I was looking for them. Uh, but they still, so I talked to John super briefly, just enough for us to coordinate Todd, you and I speaking. So right. they still went through the CVG process, which they should have. Yeah. Um, so I didn't know John, but we had a mutual friend that we both respected. Uh, and then Todd, you and I met. And um, after that, I went into the studio in person and met with all three partners. And I could just tell they were good. I'm at the point in my life where working for people who were very clearly decent and respectful um, and forward focused and kind is first priority for me. And 
I could just tell that that's who I was sitting in front of. So it just, it just seemed like we were going to be a good fit. I think we are. I, I could still say I think we are. <laughs> Absolutely. There's no question. Uh, yeah. And the up, up Studio is, I don't want to give John too much of a big head, but <laughs> good and decent is a great way to describe them. They're great, great people uh, and a great firm. Well, Emily, I know we've got about five minutes left. I want to just maybe end our part and then let you wrap it up, Emily. But I thought maybe I'd give uh, Tahia and Sarah and Lori the opportunity, any parting advice uh, as firms that may be listening in on this are considering hiring or maybe to have someone on board now and they're still kind of struggling with what that role should be. Any advice you might give small firms about hiring this position? Uh, let's start with Sarah. <laughs> Put you right on the spot. Um, I don't, well, I was thinking more if you're if you're had if you just hired someone, you know, I'd give them maybe more rain than you think you should. Um, or you might feel comfortable like they, if you have the right person, they're going to take that and they're going to like take your firm somewhere that you're not expecting and they're going to find solutions. And maybe as Lori said, maybe it's going to be a band aid, maybe it's going to be stepping stone, but like a 1% solution is going to get you to your angle. Yeah, that's great advice. I think that's good. Lori, how about you? Um, I would say in the kind of interview process or, or screening process when you're actually speaking to a candidate, um, I would try to ask for them to pull from an experience where they were proactive for a previous company. Aside from what they were asked to do, when they dug deeper into their position, what did they find that they thought was inefficient, that they could fix? And did they bring that to the owner's attention? And how did they go about fixing it? And if they weren't able to, did they feel like it was because they didn't have the autonomy to? And that will give you kind of the understanding of the workplace they're looking for, but also what they have to bring to the table. Great advice, great advice, thank you. Tahia, any parting words from you? Um, I would agree with what Lori said and, and just add on to it that um, I think one of the key things to me being successful um, in this role is how I, I view my work and my role. Um, and I think that the, that viewpoint is that it's not just about the work that I do, but how what I do affects the office and the team around me and how I can make their lives easier and better and the company better, right? And because we're all in it together and if the company's successful, then I'm successful. If I'm successful, the company's successful. Um, and so I think thinking about um, how they do their work and um, like Lori said, how they view the company as a whole and are they looking for ways that they can really push the company forward um, instead of just thinking about their work and getting out of there, right? Because you, this, this position really does need more than that. Great, great advice from all three of you. Well, I so enjoy working with all three of you and your firms and uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today and sharing your wisdom. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Emily. Sure. I don't want to get granular again, but I had one question that came across that I thought was really good and I don't think we answered. So Lori, in, in 30 seconds or less, can you tell us a little bit more about your, the business development functions that you play at Up Studio? What are you doing? Yes. Okay. 30 seconds. Let's try it. Um, <laughs> we have a tool on our site called the cost calculator. A client can come in see roughly about how much their project is going to cost. They submit to speak more with us. I then gather all of that information. I enter all of that client's information into HubSpot. At that point, I have templates that I create for my initial emails. Per Todd's guidance, we try eight times with the client before we say, okay, they're not gonna respond to us. So I will follow up eight times, typically a week apart. So I'll spend about two months if someone doesn't respond to us, nurturing that relationship or trying to. So I take care of most of the copywriting for these templates to see what sticks and what doesn't, what gets responses and what doesn't. Um, and then I try to schedule calls with John, our partner, to get them to understand our process more. At that point, my hands are pretty much out of it. So it's really that initial phase and I help John in his emailing and copywriting from that moment forward for his templates for those clients that I'm then done communicating with. And just on a, just to add, um, 
real quick for those of you listening in. I mean, we've spent a lot of time working on the lead qualification process um, at GitHub Studio and how, you know, what's most effective. Lori can go into HubSpot and look at the analytics around each of those templates. And we can kind of trace it back and say what, what approach worked really well and what didn't. Uh, and I encourage all firms to really nail down that qualification process so that the firm owners are really put in a position to close the deal, you know, and not spending a lot of their time nurturing the relationship. Um, it's uh, certainly the best function that we see. And I think all three of uh, the firms in front of you are doing a good job of, of implementing that kind of practice. And I just want to thank again our, our panelists. It was really great to hear your perspective on this very important position. Yeah. And thanks uh, to everybody for coming and all the great questions. Yeah. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy. All right.